is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Deep Wizardry by Diane Duane. Chapters 2 and 3, Senior's Song and the Blues Song. In these chapters, our friends get turned into whales, turn themselves into whales, really. Well, one of them. And it turns out that being a whale is kind of rad, unless you're in New York, which I feel like is true of a lot of species of animal, including human beings. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Devin Matthews for commissioning this episode. Devin the Great, was it? I just realized that you made a special request on your thing. Hold on. I'm going to find it so that I can do it. Uh, It was Devin the Magnificent. So everyone, thank Devin the Magnificent for making this episode happen. And uh, yeah, May his magnificence be with you forever. So these two chapters, um, man, I can't emphasize enough how much a rule follower like me gets stressed out when I read about kids who have to come home late and worry about their parents being angry at them, even though they were doing something super duper important. I know that this is a trope in a lot of stuff where kids have like superpowers and secret identities and shit. Like, I mean, even Buffy, it was like this huge thing before spoiler alert, her mom found out. Um, But (laughs) it's just super like they're, they're going on this mission. And the first thing in the morning in the, in the, uh, first chapter in this section is Nita waking up really early and her sister being all suspicious about what she's doing up so early, what she was doing up so late the other night. She noticed that Nita snuck out that night um, in a previous chapter. So we know that like, she's aware there's something going on. I think that she thinks that maybe like Nita and Kit are going and hooking up somewhere. I don't know, but I feel like she knows that's not it because there's a certain tone to it um, and to to the way that she's handling the whole thing that feels a lot more suspicious and a lot less teasing, which is what I would expect from my younger sister if she really thought that this was just like a thing about boys, you know. Um, but she, uh, Dyrene is, <laughs> she is telling Nita, like, well, it's a good thing that you got up early since mom and dad are taking us fishing today. And Nita's like, fuck, seriously? I have so much to do today. I can't be doing this. Um, and as she's saying this, she's getting dressed. And I have to read this to you guys. Oh, don't wear that, Doreen said at the sight of Nita's favorite sweatshirt. It featured numerous holes made by Poncha's teeth and the words, watch this space for further developments. I, it took me a minute to understand that joke, and that's a little messed up. It's pretty funny. <laughs> um, and she calls it tacky. And I was like, you know what, Doreen? I'm on your side. I'm on your side a little bit. It's a little tacky. Um, so here, here's the thing. What what are you going to be doing anyway? I told you swimming. You could tell them something. Nita made a face at that. She'd recently come to dislike lying to her parents. For one thing, she valued their trust. For another, a wizard whose business is making things happen by the power of the spoken word learns early on not to say things out loud that aren't true or that he doesn't want to happen which I thought was pretty compelling. Like this is actually a big thing in uh, Dresden files as well is like words mean something. And if you make a promise, it binds you in a way that you might not be aware of, but if you break that promise, it will fuck with you. It'll, it'll bounce back at you. Um, And 
yeah, Harry, uh, it's, he gets lucky a little bit because he starts off with a lot of promise breaking, really. Um, Sure, she said in bitter sarcasm. Why don't I just tell them that we're on a secret mission or that we're busy saving Long Island in the greater metropolitan area from a fate worse than death? Or maybe I could tell them that Kit and I have an appointment to go out and get turned into whales. How about that? Even without turning around, Nita could feel her sister staring at her back. Finally, the quiet made Nina twitchy. She turned around, but Dereen was already heading out of the room. Go on and eat, Dyrene said quietly over her shoulder. Sound happy. And she was gone. So, Dyrene turns out to be the MVP here. Because frankly, if Nita were an only child, I don't know what she would have done to get out of this. And I kind of like the subversion of like the little brother slash sister that always trips you up or makes things worse or ruins your chance at getting something done being uh subverted here by having her little sister be really smart maybe smarter than nita is herself and she goes out and drinks a bunch of hot water which it's super like i know it's such a silly thing to like think about but it's super gross to me that she drinks a bunch of hot water rather than just tea because she wants to be able to sustain this temperature. Just have tea. Why are you going to force yourself to drink hot water? Like, that's nothing. But I guess if you're drinking a bunch of tea and you have to leave tea bags behind, your parents are probably going to be able to pick up on the fact that you did something to get your temperature up. But anyway, uh, but yeah. And, I, and I'm assuming, like, you know, she the kettle was not on in the kitchen. So I'm assuming she drank hot water out of the tap which is even grosser. Have you guys tasted hot water from the tap? It's like pennies soaked in it for days and days. It's super gross. Um, so Jirene really took one from the team here. She drank a bunch of hot water and she sat under her father's electric blanket in order to keep her temperature up. And then comes inside acting all lethargic and convinces her mother that she's sick. She convinces her, I may add, by acting like she really wants to go, that she isn't trying to get out of it. That, no, I really want to go. Shut up. I'm not sick. I'm fine. Uh, whatever. Which, like, brilliant, brilliant. I love it. Um, so, yeah. So here it goes. Let's see. Uh, run, I owe you one. Dyrene looked up from her comic at Nita. Yeah, Dyrene said. You do. Nita felt a chill. Right, she said. I'll hang out here till they leave. Then I have to find Kit. Um, and there was the briefest pause. Then, whales, huh? Dyrene said very softly. Nita got out of there in a great hurry. So, I have to admit that at the end of the last book, when Nita tells Dyrene that she's a wizard and that there's like shit going on for her, I really thought that Dyrene like believed her and had seen enough evidence of this to take it seriously. And I didn't realize until this section that Dyrene doesn't know what's going on in a real way. And certainly didn't really realize until later when Nita is talking about it, um, that she's worried that her sister's picking up on things because it didn't seem like she was trying to hide it that much, you know, like, so I was a little taken aback by that because I, I much prefer a scenario where Tyreen is part of this and knows what's going on. So tell her, I say, you know, um, so they head over to Tiana beach and, um, they, there is like this floating platform basically that they walk out onto and get pulled out by Hotshot. Um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here because there's this amazing general store that just stays open all the time. And she has to go through there in order to get out to the beach because uh, Kit is in there on the phone. And there is a dog in there that is named Dog. And... 
even though she can talk to him, he is not impressed by this at all, which I kind of hoped that it would warm him up. Nope, doesn't. Hi, dog, Nita said, being careful not to get too close. Dog showed Nita his teeth. Go chew dry bones, he said in a growl. Same to you, Nita said pleasantly and made a wide detour around him, heading for the phone booth in the rear of the store. Um, so Kit is on the phone with Tom and Carl. And Tom is the first one. On, uh, I love this so much. Tom is on the phone, but really Peach is dominating the conversation from the background. Peach is yelling and howling and doing the thing that Peach do, which is just cause trouble. Um, and I love the uh, way that this is described. Um, well, hi there yourself, Tom Swale's voice came back. He would doubtless have gone on with more of the same if someone else further away from his end of the line hadn't begun screaming hello hello in a creaky high-pitched voice that sounded as if tom were keeping his insane grandmother chained up in the living room <laughs> that just cracks me up <laughs> oh god um even a pair of senior wizards must have wondered what to do with a creature that would at one moment deliver the evening news a day early in a flawless imitation of major newscaster you pleased, of whichever major newscaster you pleased, and then a second later start ripping up the couch for the fun of it. Um, meanwhile, you can hear uh, Carl yelling in the background about how Peach is eating the eggs out of the frying pan on the stove, and he calls her a little cannibal. Um, so it turns out that the information that Kit was after is like, uh, what's the word? It's eyes only. So they have to get his permission and he has to like release it, which is kind of fun because like in the book, it, tr it changes from having the stamp next to it. It's like uh, restricted to see, see chart page 1096. Um, and I'm trying to find this uh, little moment. Do, do, do. Okay, yeah. Uh, we need an intervention authorization for an offshore area. Yeah, that's right. Here's the numbers. Um, found herself looking at a map of the East Coast from Nova Scotia to Virginia, but the coast itself was squeezed far over on the left-hand side, and individual cities and states were only sketchily indicated. The map was primarily concerned with the ocean. Okay, I've got it in my book, too, Tom said. All those lines in the middle of the water are contour lines, indicating the depth of the sea bottom. You can see there aren't many lines within about 100 miles of Long Island. The bottom isn't much deeper than 100 feet within that distance. But then you see a lot of contour lines packed close together. That's the edge of the continental shelf. Think of it as a cliff or a mesa with the North American continent sitting on top of it. Then there's a steep drop, the cliff just a shade less than a mile high. Um, a 5,000 foot drop, not straight down, but straight enough. Then the sea bottom keeps on slipping eastward and downward. It doesn't slope as fast as before, but it goes deep, some 15,000 feet down, and it gets deeper yet farther out. Um, so I, I love this. Uh, let me know when you get back, Tom said, because that's where you're going. Nita and Kit looked at each other in shock. But I thought even submarines couldn't go down that far, Nita said. They can't. Neither can most whales normally. But it helps to be a wizard, Tom said. Look, don't panic yet. Go ahead! Panic! Screamed Pichu from somewhere in the background. Do it now and avoid the June rush. Fear death by water. Oh my god, Pichu. Stop it. Go ahead and avoid the June rush. That's so good because it's death by water. If I was going to do something about politics, I'd be like, do it now and avoid the November rush. I love it. It's so good. It's so funny. I don't. <laughs> and then Carl says, you're honing in, you're honing for a punch in the beak. Violence? You want violence? I'll give you violence. No quarter asked or given. Damn the torpedoes. Full speed ahead. Don't give up the. Ah! Thanks, Carl, Tom said as silence fell. 
You won't be going out there and diving straight down. There's a specific approach to the plane. Look back closer to the island and you'll see some contours drawn in dotted lines. So he gives them some uh, general information about how this whole area goes. And Nita asks if it's safe. And Tom says, of course not. But the natural dangers at Carl's department. He'll fill you in on precaution on uh, what precautions you'll need to take. And I suspect the whales will, too. Natural dangers, Kit said, meaning there are unnatural ones, too. In wizardry, when aren't there? There, This much I can tell you, though. New York City has not been kind to that area. All kinds of things, even unexploded depth charges, have been dumped at the head of the Hudson Canyon over the years. Most of them are marked on your map, but watch out for ones that aren't. And the city has been dumping raw sewage into the Hudson Channel area for decades. Evidently, in the old days, before people were too concerned about ecology, they thought the water was so deep the dumping wouldn't do any harm. But it has. Quite a bit of the sea bottom life in that area, especially the vegetation that the fish depend on for food, has been killed off entirely. Other species have been changed. The manual will give you the details. You won't like them. Yikes. We've got mutant fish swimming around because of people's poop. Is that what that boils down to? <laughs> oh, God. Um, so, do, do, do. Oh, okay. Then he talks about Karen Peak, which I looked up is a real place, but I was shocked that there are no photos of this. Um, Karen Peak, some of the oceanographers think it's simply the westernmost peak of an undersea mountain range called the Kelvin Seamounts. Some think otherwise. The geological history of that area is bizarre. But either way, the peak's an important spot and impressive. That one peak is 6,000 feet high. It stands up sheer from the bottom all alone, a third as high as Everest, which is pretty cool, actually. But yeah, I couldn't find, I could find tons of maps, but I couldn't find a photo of it from like the water, you know, which I thought would be pretty wild to see. Um, and he says that there is so much magic that's like tangled up in that area that uh, it can sort of affect the new magic that gets performed there, which I thought was pretty interesting, um, the residual magic concept. And Kit says, Sri said that the danger level wouldn't go above moderate. She said it shouldn't, Nita said. Probably it won't, Tom said. He didn't sound convinced, though. You should bear in mind that the danger levels for humans and whales differ. Still, the book said she was about to be promoted to advisory status, so she would know that. All the same, you two keep your eyes open. I'm just like, ah, oh, I don't like any of this at all. The anxiety, you guys. Um, from all indications, the Song of the Twelve is a lovely wizardry and a powerful one. Probably the most powerful magic done on a regular basis. The sources say it leaves the participants forever changed for the better. At least it does when it works. When it fails, which it has once or twice in the past, it fails because some participant has broken the rules. And those times it's failed, well, all I can say is that I'm glad I wasn't born yet. Be careful. Is Hotshot going to fuck this up? Y'all, I told you, first episode, I'm prejudiced against dolphins. I don't like Hotshot anyway. Like, no matter what animal he were, but the fact that he's a dolphin just makes it worse. Hotshot's going to ruin this shit, right? Am I right? He's going to ruin it. Ugh, this is going to be awful. Um, so, they ask Peach for some... Uh, what's the word? Advice? is Feels... They ask her to basically give her take on this whole thing. Um, here it is. Do what the night tells you. Don't be afraid to give yourself away and read the small print before you sign. Which I hope that they actually pay attention to this. Um, Huggabug says, I wasn't on last time, but I agree dolphins are assholes. Yes, I don't like them. Dolphins are like, I, I feel like I read something and I can't, can't remember and I need to look into this again. But I read something about how like dolphins are bullies. Uh, to other fish and animals in the water and I just it sank in and I think that I just didn't like dolphins that much to begin with so I read this thing and it really like 
struck home for me in a way. And I just clung to that. Um, so Nita decides to leave Kit and Kit starts talking to Carl about the monsters, giant man-eating clams, giant squid, krakens, Kit said. I don't care what you call them. They're still giant squid and squid belong in sushi. I don't like this. Amen, Nita. Definitely. Um, I heard a thing on NPR about how they're actually kind of rapey towards humans. You know what? Maybe that's what I'm thinking of, Hugabug. Maybe that's it. Um, all right. So there's this moment when, let's see. They struck out through the breakers into water that was again surprisingly warm. This time Nita wasn't able to enjoy it quite as much. The thought of undersea volcanoes was much with her. But even she couldn't be depressed for long when they paused to rest a moment, dog paddling, and from behind came the nudge in the back she remembered, followed by a dolphin laugh. You rotten thing, she said, turning to rub Hotshot affectionately. I'm going to get you for the first time you did that. You'll have to catch me first, Hotshot said with a wicked chuckle. As well he might have, for nothing in the sea, except perhaps a killer whale or one of the great sharks on the hunt, was fast enough to catch a dolphin that didn't want to be caught. Except for a tuna net. Just saying. Um, so, let's talk about the fact that this whole thing is set right near Sandy Hook. That's a shame. It's such a bummer that we have these new associations with like places and names because of fucking mass shootings. And I mean, there's a character in one of the uh, red wall books named Columbine. And it's just, you know, nowadays that just carries such a certain like imagery with it that I can't let go of it as I'm reading. And Sandy hook is, is mentioned by name like eight times in this chapter alone. So it was just constantly me just being like, Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Like over and over again, because I, I kept trying to let myself forget about what, it, what Sandy hook represents in my lifetime. And it wasn't really easy to do. Um, it's a, sh it's just such a shame, you know, like that kind of, it's like if you were reading something that was set entirely in the twin towers and it, it, you know, they just kept mentioning. Um, so, do, 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 Nita has to go first and get into the water to, with three to change into a whale. This is pretty cool. Um, so, Kit is, is talking about how you do this. And Suri suggests you pretend hard enough and sooner or later what you're pretending to be, you are. And Kit's like, oh, come on. How, wh whatever, however hard you pretend, just doing that wouldn't work without wizardry. Exactly right, Kit. Wizardry, not one particular spell. The only reason it works for you is that you know wizardry works and are willing to have it so. Belief is no good either. Belief is such, uh, always has doubt at the bottom. It's knowing that makes wizardry work, which I really like because that whole like just believe kind of thing, as much as I understand the mentality behind it, but there's so many stories where it's just like, but you just have to believe it'll work. I'm sorry. I can't make myself 100% in my heart believe something that it doesn't. You just can't make yourself believe things. That's not how believing works. Like you can have faith that things will work out. But that's not really the same thing, is it? And belief is just, you know, it, belief can lead to all kinds of ugly things. So the idea of making yourself believe in something that's not true has a bit of a sinister note to it in some ways to me that I don't feel like most people really like either notice or care about. But it does bother me. So I like the fact that this is just like, well, you know, but you know, it'll work. So it's okay. It's different um, because it is different. It is. Wizardry does not live in the unwilling heart. The sea says there'd be lots more wizards if people were able to give doubt and belief. Um, like other habits, though, they're hard to break. 
there's a lot of typos in my book. I'm realizing there's a couple things that I've had to correct as I've been reading. Um, but which is kind of weird because it's the Kindle version and it's like the paid for version. I didn't download it illegally or anything. And you'd think that they could update that more often, but hmm. Um, it did take me a while to know for sure that it wasn't just a coincidence when the thing I'd done the spell for actually happened as soon as I'd done the spell, Kit admitted. I guess I see the problem. Then you're ready for the solution, Sri said. Past the change itself, the chief skill of unass unassisted shape changing lies in not pretending so hard you can't get back again. And as I've said, and the way that I should mention Sri says each of their names, Kit's name is spelled essentially the same except instead of an i in the middle it's an exclamation point which is upside down when she says nita's name it's lowercase h capital n i i apostrophe t i'm not exactly sure how that's supposed to sound i imagine nit, 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 which is like no good um but the kit with the kit like i don't know what that's supposed to sound like um, so Nita has to strip out of her bathing suit, which she feels major weird about in front of Kit. And then she starts to free float in the water and thinks about the, I, I really like this. Um, it's all right. She thought the air's right above me. If I need it, she hung weightless in the green, thinking of nothing in particular down there in the water. Sri's note seemed louder, fuller. It vibrated against the ears, against the skin, inside the lungs, filling everything. And there was something familiar about it. Cousin, Sri had called her. And we have blood in common, she had said. So it should be easy. A matter of remembering not what you have been, but what somewhere else you are. Simply allow what is somewhere else to be what is here. And the change is done. Effortless. Nita shut her eyes on the greenness and trusted to the wizardry inside her. That was it. Wizardry does not live in the unwilling heart. Not the kind of will that meant gritted teeth resisting something else like your own disbelief that was trying to undermine you. Not willpower, but the will that was desire. The will so strong that it couldn't be resisted by all the powers of normality. Um, so, she manages to imagine and opens her eyes, and is a whale. And I really like that the fact that her eyeballs are each on different sides of her head is really, like, jarring to her, and that that's addressed, because that's a thing that's, like, what's... I mean, you know, predators, they have their eyes in the front. It's supposed to be the thing. Um, so human beings are just set up in a very different way. She was seeing colors she had no names for, and many she had names for were gone. Hands she still seemed to have, but her fingers hung down oddly long and heavy. Her elbows were glued to her sides, and her sides themselves went on for what seemed like years. Her legs were gone. A tail and graceful flukes were all she had left. Her nose seemed to be on the top of her head, and her mouth somewhere south of her chin, and she resolved to ask Sri well out of Kit's hearing what had happened to some other parts of her. Sri, Nita said, and was amazed to hear it come out in the middle of her head in a whistle instead of words. It was easy. Um, so, that's pretty cool, and she seems to, like, be having a good time in her whale body. Um... I really love the detail here, too. Uh, more amazement yet. Nita wanted to simply roll over and lie back in the water at the sheer richness of the sound of Sri's words. She had done the usual experiments in school that proved water was a more efficient conductor of sound than air. But she hadn't dreamed of what that effect would be like when one was a whale, submerged in the conducting medium, and wearing a hundred square feet of skin that was a more effective hearing organ than any human ear. Suddenly, sound was a thing that stroked the body, sensuous as a touch, indistinguishable from the liquid one she swam in. Wild. This is such a cool idea, like the whole concept of sound being something that she can feel all over her. And that it 
is essentially like a second vision because it she mentions how um with astonishing pre- precision she could uh detect the rocks on the bottom weed 300 yards away schools of fish she didn't need to see them she could feel their textures on her skin as if they touched her yet she could also distinctively perceive their distance from her more accurately than she could have told it with mere sight fascinated she swam a couple circles around the platform making random noises and getting the feel of the terrain i don't believe it someone said above nita in a curious flat voice with no echoes about it is that how he sounds nita thought and surfaced to look at kit out of first one eye then the other um he looked no different from the way he usually did but something about him struck nita as utterly hilarious though at first she couldn't figure out what it was then it occurred to her he had legs <laughs> what a dope am i right legs god what is this 1995 legs are out kid get some get some fins baby um i like to that it's just her laughter is described as sounding exactly like oatmeal boiling hard which is super gross sort of reminds me of um <laughs> that for foley effects a lot of times they will take like um a container filled with like a thick liquid and move a spoon through it for certain sounds of like boiling and whatnot and uh, i always think of like when you're stirring macaroni and cheese that like it's so gross um so kit's deal is different she has to just use her own wizardry and her imagination and like and her confidence in her magic to make this change but that's not going to be what kit does it turns out that there is this mesh work called a whale sark not whale shark which is how i definitely read it the first time a whale sark um that contains the i don't want to say consciousness more like memories of a whale that had passed away and was like determined to to pass on its its knowledge and abilities to someone so i'm gonna read this as well um it was a filmy delicate irregular meshwork its strands knotted into a net some th- six feet square the knotting was an illusion as nita found when she glided closer to it Each knot was a round swelling or bowl where several threads joined. Flashes of green-white light rippled along the net whenever it moved, and all Nita's senses, those of whale and wizard alike, prickled with the electric feeling of a live spell, tangled in the mesh and impatient to be used. Um, It's a sort of a shadow of a whale's nervous system made by wizardry. At the whale's death, before the life lightning's gone, a spell-constructed energy duplicate of the whale's brain and nerves is made from the pattern laid down by the living nerves and brain. The duplicate then has an assisted shape-change spell woven into it. When the work's done properly, contact with the Sark is enough to change the wearer into whatever kind of whale the donor was. This is a sperm whale Sark, like the Avon who donated it. He was a wizard who worked these waters several thousand full moons ago and something of a seer so that when he died, instead of leaving himself wholly to the sea, even said we should make a sark of him because there would be some need. Come try it on for size, Kit. Um, so Kit, understandably, is a little bit like the fact that this wasn't mentioned until he's literally in the water, I find very uh thoughtless i feel like this is something that we should have covered as a class beforehand and i don't like the fact that this gets left to the last second like this but it's fine um just put it around you and wrap it tight and he does it sort of like gets a mind of its own and seems to like awaken and wrap itself more tightly around him and he begins to struggle against it and sink and kind of like falls out of sight for a second before there's like this explosion of light and glitter um essentially and all of a sudden here he is as this massive fucking uh what's that a hundred a hundred feet easy sperm whale which i really hate that it's called a sperm whale can we just talk can we just address 
the elephant in the room here about how it's called a sperm whale and that it's terrible because it's not just what sperm is. The word sperm is horrible. It's a horrible word. Sperm. Why? Why do we have to name a whale after that? It's a giant fucking creature. It really deserves a much more majestic name. Like, I just don't, it's like, I'm trying to think of other things, like parts of the body that are just kind of like awkward and, and badly named, like nipple. It's like if we were like, oh, that's a nipple shark. Why? Why would you do that? You know? No. Mm-mm. Dislike. So um, I'm going to just call him the big one. We're going to call him the big whale. And I will not say sperm whale again, or I will try to avoid it at all costs. Um, so... His voice ranged into a deeper register than a humpback's and had a sharper sound to it, more clicks and buzzes. It was not entirely comfortable on the skin. I wish you'd warned me. I couldn't, Sri said, or you might have fought it even harder than you did, and the change might have refused to take. That would have been trouble for us. If a whale sark rejects a person once, it'll never work for him at all. After this, it'll be easier for you, which in itself will make some problems. Right now, though, let's get going. Take a long breath. I want to get out of the bay without attracting too much attention. I'm really curious why she picks Kit for this and not Nita. Um, I don't feel like that's ever mentioned in this section. And we might find out later. But she says something about, like, you know, if it rejects you once, it will never work for you again. So we'd be in major trouble. And I'm like, yeah, but you do have another wizard there that you could test it on. Like, why are you acting like Nita's not an option at all? Is like, I, I don't know. Um, so they're swimming along and, um, Nita is really like entranced by all of the things that she's seeing as she swims by. And she and Kit is, are talking about the, uh, differences in their voices. And she says, um, he says, Cerise is kind of twitchy, and she says, yeah, you've got sharp edges. And he says, you've got fur. I do not. Oh, yes, you do. It's soft, your voice. Not like your usual one. Nita was unsure whether to take this as a compliment, so she let it lie. The moment had abruptly turned into one of those times when she had no idea just what to say to Kit. The sort of sudden silence that was acutely painful to Nita, though Kit never seemed to notice it at all. Nita couldn't think of anything to do about the problem, which was the worst part of the whole business. She wasn't about to mention the problem to her mom, and on this subject, the wizard's manual was hugely unhelpful. So this poor sweet little sausage is just like falling into a crush, and when things get a little bit too close to him saying anything like nice to her, she just freaks out, which I really relate to. I understand that deeply. Um, as somebody who like, even as an adult is not like sharing their feelings, when somebody says something to me, that's a little bit too close to like a compliment. I'm just like, no, 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 don't do it. Just don't talk. Thank you. Um, Huggabug says that Nita isn't being considered because Nita's magic is nature based and Kit is mechanical, but isn't this as nature based as it gets? I mean, it's a, it looks like a, I don't know. I don't know. Is it? It's not mechanical, is it? Like the item itself? Um, I don't know how this works. I wouldn't think that mechanical would be like something that the uh, whales even dealt with at all. But Devin agrees with me. Me too. Yeah, that kind of thing is just super awkward and I hate it. Um, Let's see. We have a sort of physical very vari- we we haven't the sort of physical variations you have. Differences in head shape and so forth. And even if we did, what good would a distinction be if you had to come right up to someone to make it? By voice, we can tell how far away a friend is, how he's feeling, practically what he's thinking. Though the closer a friend is to you, usually the harder it is to tell what's on his mind with any accuracy, which I find that to be pretty interesting. Um and I love that right after that, Nita starts to say something, to sing something, and then catches herself back to silence. Like she realizes that if you can tell what I'm thinking, then maybe I shouldn't talk at all so that you can't get a sense of the fact that I'm crushing on you real, real bad. Um, I think that's what makes it easier for her to do on her own without the help, says Huggabug. Oh, okay. I got you. That's interesting. Um, 
Devin says, I think what did to transform is harder to do than they made it out to be, but her healing three made it easier since she's had her blood in her. Oh, okay. Both of you've got good points there. That's interesting. Huh. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. Um, the dangers are different for each of you since you've changed by different methods. As I said, Nita, you have to be aware pretending too hard, thinking so much like a whale that you don't want to be a human being anymore or forget how. Wizards have been lost that way before, and there's no breaking the spell from outside. Once you're stuck inside the changed shape, no one but you can break out again. If you start finding your own memories difficult to recall, it's time to get out of the whale shape before it becomes you permanently. Right, Nita said. She wasn't very worried. Being a humpback was delightful, but she'd no desire to spend her life that way. Your problem's different, though, Kit. Your change is powered more by the spell resident in the whale sark than by anything you're doing yourself. And all the sark's done is confuse your own body into thinking it's a whale body for the time being. That confusion can be broken by several different kinds of distraction. The commonest is when your own mind, which is stronger than the whale mind left in the sark, starts to override the instructions the whale sark is giving your body. Suppose we were... Oh, say, several hundred humpback lengths down in the crushing dark, and suddenly your whale body started trying to behave like a human's body. Human breathing rate, human pulse and thought and movement patterns, human response to pressures and the temperatures of water. So you see the problem. Spending too much time in the sark and, your, and part of your brain responsible for handing your, handling your breathing and so forth will begin to overpower the dead brain preserved in the sark. Your warning signs are nearly the opposite of Nita's. Language is the first thing to go. If you find yourself losing whale song, you must surface and get out of the sark immediately. Ignore the warning. Ignore the warning. The best that can happen is that the whale sark will probably be so damaged it can never be used again. The worst thing, she didn't say it. The worry in her voice was warning enough. So that's pretty interesting. She, so Nita has to worry about enjoying being a whale too much and losing who she is as a person and and kit has to worry about remembering that he's a person and turning back into himself underwater where he could die uh that sucks hope that doesn't happen because that seems like the worst possible thing um so as they're swimming, Nita's like looking around at all the different types of, of fish and the coral and everything. And all of a sudden she like notices all these little blue fish and gets really excited and swims through them to eat them. And at first just kind of like, oh dear, I'm holding everybody else up. And when she looks up, she realizes that Sri is also having a snack and that Kit has been eating like practically this whole time. Um, and I just find like the whole thing about how whales eat is just such a weird, like they just need so much food, but there's nothing big enough for them. So they like in the water to be a predator, the way that you think of a predator, which is like picking out a particular animal and hunting it down. So they are meat eaters, but they are grazers anyway, which I find really wild, you know? Um, it's like if there were an animal that just sort of sailed through the air with like a big butterfly net attached to its mouth, catching flies in the air, you know, less, less focused than say a bat who also eats flies. Um, but yeah, I just find that to be so wild and they find all of these cars under the water that are used to like start coral reefs. Um, which is something that I, I was seeing recently that there's like a, a real effort being made. You know, a lot of coral reefs have been dying because of pollution and being worn down. And there are a lot of different, um, uh, charities out there that put these, I, and I'm not remembering what it was because it wasn't like car parts because those rust and corrode. This is something specifically made to rebuild a reef but using recycled materials i wish i could remember what it was and uh it works really beautifully as it turns out and i just think that's so cool how we can like fuck up our environment real bad and the environment can often come back it needs help it needs us to be aware but it's a like a lot of the ecosystem is extraordinarily resilient and adaptable um, that's not to say that we can't still kill it, of course, but lucky for the environment, 
we will die first in a lot of cases. <laughs> so, um, so don't you think it would be a good idea if we surface now? N Nita and Kit looked at one another in shock, then started upward in a hurry, with Sri following them at a more leisurely pace. How long have we been down? Kit whistled. They surfaced in a rush, all three, and blew. Sri looked at Kit in some puzzlement. The question apparently meant nothing to her. Long enough to need to come up again, she said. Which, as we find out later, the fact that she can't, like, understand time in human terms is going to be a problem. You know? Like, yeah. This is, it, I mean, that's probably was like four hours, you know, kind of thing. Um, they left as, as early as possible. So she fluked hard once or twice, using her tail to lift herself out of the swell and was surprised to see, standing up from shore half a mile away, a tall brick tower with a pointed weathered green bronze top. A red light flashed at the tower's peak. Jones Beach already, she said. That's miles and miles from Tiana. So they swim on and they get towards, and this is the part that I thought was really fascinating. Um... There had been only the single mournful hoot of the Shinnecock horn and the far-off sound of the various buoy bells. But this close to New York Harbor, the peaceful background hiss of the ocean soon turned into an incredible racket. Bells and horns and whistles and gongs shrieked, clunked, and wanged in the water as they passed them. And no sooner was she out of range of one than another assaulted her twitching skin. Singing pained notes at one another, the three ran the gauntlet of sound. It got worse instead of better as they got closer to the harbor entrance, and to the banging and clanging was added the sound of persistent dull engine noise. Their course to Sandy Hook, unfortunately, crossed all three of the major approaches to New York Harbor. Along all three of these, big boats came and went with an endless low throbbing, and small ones passed with a rattling, jarring buzz that reminded Nita of lawnmowers and chainsaws. The three surfaced often to get relief from the sound until Sri warned them to dive deep for a long underwater run through one of the shipping lanes. Nita was beginning to feel the slow discomfort that was a whale's experience of shortness of breath before Sri headed to the surface again. They breached in blue and looked around them. Not far away stood a huge black white lettered structure on four steel pillars. A white building stood atop the deck, and beside it was a red tower with several flashing lights. A horn on the platform sang one non-committal note, short, long, short, long, again and again. Um, after this, it'll be quieter. There are a few markers between here and the hook. And listen, there's a friend's voice. So they get down there, and they meet Arun? Aaron? A row. Um, this is a really old whale who has lived a life. Um, and I need to, before I get into that, cause like I wanted to get right into that, but I forgot about this instance with hotshot. So apparently sperm whales aren't big fans of dolphins either. Like, I don't know about all dolphins, but <sighs> How are our fry doing out here? Hotshot said, swimming careless rings around Nita as he sang. Getting used to the fins all right? Pretty much, Nita said. Hotshot did one last loop around her and headed off in Kit's direction. How about you, Minnow? <coughs> the huge jaw of a sperm whale abruptly opened right in front of Hotshot and closed before he could react, so that a moment later, the dolphin was keeping quite still, while Kit held him with great delicacy in his huge fangs. Kit's eyes looked angry, but the tone of his song was casual enough. Hot shot, he said, not stopping, just swimming along with casual deliberateness. I'm probably singing, too, and even if I'm not, I am a sperm whale. Don't push your luck. Hot shot said nothing. Kit swam a few more of his own length, then opened his mouth and let the dolphin loose. Hey, he said then, no hard feelings. Of course not, Hotshot said in his usual reckless, merry voice. But Nita noticed that the dolphin made his reply from a safe distance. No problem, mi Ah, Kit. Minnow it is, Kit said, sounding casual himself. What was that all about? I'm not sure, Kit said, 
And now that only Nita was listening, he sounded a bit shaken. Sri might have been right when she said this body doesn't actually have what's his voice's memories, but the body has its own memories. What it's like to be a sperm, what it means, I guess. You don't make fun of us, them. Neats, don't let me get lost. Huh? Me? I don't beat people up. That's not my style. You didn't beat him up. No, I just did the ocean equivalent of pinning him up against the wall and scaring him a good one. Neats, I got into being a wizard because I wanted other people not to do that kind of stuff to me. And now... I'll keep an eye on you, Nita said, as they began to come up on another foghorn. Um, so, yeah, the foghorn is not a foghorn. This is a whale. Um, the waters around Sandy Hook boil with krill in the spring and summer, so that by night the krill's warning luminescence, swarming luminescence defines every current and fin stroke in a blaze of blue-green light. And by day, the sun slants through the water, brown with millions of tiny bodies, as thickly as through the air in a dusty room. As the, groups, as the group dived, they began to make out a great dark shape in the cloudy water, moving so slowly it barely did more than drift. A last brown-red curtain of water parted before them in a swirl of current, and Nita found herself staring down at her first blue whale. So yeah, this guy has seen some shit. He's kind of like a a calmer, cooler Mad-Eye Moody, like so banged up and just like, you know, fucking has lived his life and this shit is real and he has seen the shit that people should not see maybe and has lived through some things that maybe should have killed him. And I find it really interesting. Um, Eldest blew about the gates, Sri sang, sounding more formal than Nita had ever heard her. I greet you. Senior for the gate waters, said the blue in his deep voice with slow dignity. I greet you also. Um, he calls hot shot swift fire in the water. Which, for some reason, Hotshot, like, is embarrassed by. But is it just me, or is Swift Fire in the Water the raddest name ever? Like, that's like, that sounds like a Native American name, you know? When you you have, like, there's a verb in there, or you have, like, just, uh, you know, like, uh uh bear in the in the river or something like that like there's this sort of poetry to it swift fire in the water is a sick ass name and hotshot is a stupid dumb name and he should definitely go by swift fire in the water instead of hotshot but i wouldn't expect a dickhead loser like a dolphin to understand that so i guess i shouldn't be too surprised all right they have to take their pledges here um and this is, <laughs> I love that Sri says they're calves. With all due respect, senior, they are not, Arun said. They came back from that place. That's no calf's deed. Many who were older than they did not come back. You will sing with us. What parts? I'm not sure yet, Kit said. Sri needs to see if all her people come in. The silent lord, Nita said. Indeed. Arun looked at her for several long moments. You are a good age for it, he said, and you are learning the song. Um, so I forgot about this. They kind of have to like memorize their parts or like know their like, which is really nerve wracking to me. Um, there is old trouble and old power about you and your friend, as if blood hung in the water where you swim. The lone power apparently knows your names. It will not have forgotten the disservice you did it recently. You are greatly daring to draw its attention to you again. Even the heart of the sea, time heart as your kind calls it, may not be quiet for one who has freely attracted the lone one's enmity. Beware what you do and do what you say. Nowhere does the lone power enter in so readily as through the broken word. Sir, Nita said, rather unnerved, I'll be careful. That is well. Arun looked for a moment at Kit before speaking. It is a whale, Sark, is it not? Uh, have a care of it should you find yourself in one of the more combative parts of the song. Sperm whales were fighters before they were singers. I can't not say sperm whale. It's right here. And though their songs are often the fairest in the sea, the old blood rises too often and chokes those songs off before they can be sung. Keep your mouth closed. 
you were best and you'll do well enough. Um, so let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, very well. Sri swam up close to Arun so that she was looking him straight in one eye with one of hers. And when she began to sing, it was in a tone even more formal and careful than in, than that in which she had greeted him. Arun wa ulor, those who gather to sing that song that is the sea's shame and the sea's glory, desire you to be of their company. Say for my hearing whether you consent to that song. I consent, the blue said in notes so deep that coral cracked and fell off rock shelves some yards away. And I will weave my voice and my will and my blood with that of those who sing if there be need. I ask the second time that those with me, both of your mastery and not, may hear. Do you consent to the song? I consent, and may my wizardry and my mastery depart from me sooner than I abandon that other mastery. Uh, sooner than I abandon that other mastery, I shall undertake in the song celebration. The third time and the last, I ask that the sea and the heart of the sea shall hear. Do you consent to the song? Freely I consent, Arun sang with a calm finality, and may I find no place in that heart but wander forever amid the broken and the lost, sooner than I shall refuse the song or what it brings about for the good of those who live. Then I accept you as celebrant of the song, as blue and as latest of the line of saviors, Sri said, and though those who swim are swift to forget, the sea forgets neither song nor singer. She turned a bit, looking behind her at hot shot. Might as well get all of you done at once, she said. Hot shot? The dolphin went through the oath much faster than Arun had, though his embarrassment at being referred to as swift fire in the water was this time so acute that Nita actually turned away so she wouldn't have to look at him. As for the rest of the oath, though, Hotshot recited it as Nina had expected, with the mindless speech of a person who thinks he has much more important matters to attend to. This asshole is going to fuck shit up. I'm already mad at him. So they take their oaths. The, the other two, uh, we can't give Kit the oath yet. We don't know who he's going to be. So um, only Nita is able to do it. Uh, I consent and I will weave my voice and my will and my blood with that of those who sing. If there, if there be need. It was astonishing how much meaning could be packed into a few notes, and the music itself was fascinating, so somber but with that odd thread of joy running through it. And may I find no place in that heart but wander forever amidst the broken and lost, sooner than I shall refuse the song or what it brings about for the good of those who live. Um, now, Sri, give me names so I'll know whom to call. And she gives him some and he says that he's going to do the call and that they need to get the hell out of here right now. Um, that it's a really powerful wizardry and they kind of need to be far away when he does it. Uh, he, and when Kit expresses some surprise that just singing their names will do that, she says, Kit, that's plenty. Don't you pay attention when someone calls you by your name? Your name is part of you. There's power in it, tied up with the way you secretly think of yourself, the truth of the way you are. Know what a person's name means to him, know who he feels he is, and you have power over him. That's what Arun is using. That was a bit of information that started Nita's thoughts going in nervous circles. How do I think of myself? Does this mean that the people who know what I think can control me? I'm not sure I like this. Um, so... He is in the middle of like weaving this magic, which looks really cool and glowy in the water. And they break the surface of the water to take a breath. And it turns out that it is dark outside and they are very, very late. And when they finally ask Sri how long the song is going to take, she says two days. But she doesn't phrase it like that, of course. She says a couple lights as it's reckoned in the above. Two days? We're in trouble, Kit said. That's exactly what we're in. Sri, let's put our tails into it. Even if we're getting home right now, we have some explaining to do. Um, 
or even if we were getting home right now, we'd have some explaining to do. She turned and swam in the direction where her sharpening whale sense told her home was. It was going to be bad enough having to climb out of this splendid, strong, graceful body and put her own back on again. But Dyrene was waiting to give her the Spanish Inquisition when she got home. And her mother and father were going to give her more of those strange looks. Uh, and Kit's dad, who was terminally protective of his son, might make Kit come home. That thought was worst of all. Oh, is it? Is it the worst of all? You sweet little sausage. Um, but it turns out that her parents are like, her dad is so tired and her mom is so cranky from having to be cleaning these fish that neither of them really even notice that she's that late. They're just kind of distracted. And uh, she falls into bed, but she's, it says, an uneasy sense of something incomplete, something that was going to come up again later and not in a way she'd like. So I'm curious about that because I feel like the name thing really means something that's not spelling any good for our friend here. Um, but on the plus side, <laughs> I was going to say on the plus side, but it's not really. She was all, she's already like, oh, I have to get out of this awesome whale body and get into my human body. This blows. And I'm like, girl, you better watch out because that's kind of the thing that you're supposed to be like aware of, you know? Um, I just noticed that Devin commented on the side. I feel bad for any dolphin listeners out there. Listen, dolphin listeners can get bent. I don't need them. Whatever. Dolphins. Um, they're all show offs anyway. All right. Well, that's the end of that section. So thank you very much to Devin for commissioning this. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you to hug a bug for coming to the chat as well. And uh, I hope that you guys have been enjoying my coverage of this. And yeah, I'm running late here, so I'm going to have to wrap it up. But I love you guys. I hope that you've been having a good time. And I will see you soon with a new episode, hopefully. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.